thanks for joining our conversation on COVID-19 and inequity in healthcare design. Um, today, we are gonna have a conversation moderated by members from our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusiveness Committee, Larry Sykes and Holly Hall. And our panelists are Michael Hagan and Brenna Costello from the Academy of Architecture for Health Knowledge Community. Uh, so Larry and Holly will be leading the discussion with questions that they've developed. And um, I encourage all of our attendees to participate via chat or Q&A if you've got anything to add. You'll find those features at the bottom of your screen, your Zoom screen. Um, and I'll let the committees take it away. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Megan. Um, hi, everybody. I uh, kind of wanted to get this conversation going after um, seeing some really kind of uh, dismaying statistics around um, racial inequities with uh, COVID deaths and infections, both in um, other states and here in Colorado. Uh, just this week, we've gotten some information, some data in from the state, uh, the state of Colorado. And so, um, you know, just wanted to kind of have a discussion with the um, Academy of Architecture for Health Knowledge uh, folks here in Colorado about, you know, their perspectives on um, healthcare design and, and facilities um, related to COVID. Um, so Holly and I have uh, some questions that we're gonna use to kind of help spark this conversation. Um, thank you, uh, Michael and Brenna for joining us. Um, Holly, do you wanna kick it off with the first question? Sure. Um, uh, let's see. Um, because of COVID-19, we know there are discussions already um, taking place about HVAC systems and wellness and indoor health, um, especially in healthcare facilities. But if, um, what if any other discussions are you having about um, equity for all of design of healthcare facilities? Not, not just specifically the systems in place. We know things are gonna change that way, but just how, how this can, how diversity can help, how this situation can help the diversity within the facility. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I guess I'll go ahead and take uh, a stab at this one. I think that, um, there's kind of two facets to this. There's kind of in general healthcare facilities, and then there's the current situation we're in and how that might affect future healthcare facilities and um, the diversity within that. I think specifically what, what we've seen as a, um, as a healthcare practice related to COVID is um, there is no line of um, demarcation of diverse equity and any um, disparities within that. I think what we've recognized from a health system, the health systems that we do work with is that everyone has really come together and put the best interests at hand for um, not only the patients, but really uh, a big focus is on the clinical workers and how we can keep them safe while caring for our in our entire community. So I think I would say during this, this current moment, um, I think those barriers probably have been broken down more than previous and maybe more than future because we're all kind of in this new water together and um, treading lightly and, and coming up with ideas, no ideas bad. And we're, we're listening, listening to really everyone. I think from a design team perspective, it's, it's a holistic approach to help the health systems in any way possible. You know, you mentioned the HVAC systems and the wellness and indoor health. That's definitely top priority. But I think what I've seen is kind of a, a, a communal gathering from the design industry, the healthcare workers, and our clients to come together and brainstorm. And all, all that's been to date is, is a lot of brainstorming, not a whole lot of implementation. And that's probably what we'll see um, in the next several months moving forward is some implementation phases and that's when we should probably start to elevate and recognize um, the diversity aspect of it. Yeah, I would absolutely imagine it would take time to implement. I mean, you know, you can't just go do something overnight. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, thank you for that. If I, if I could add to that, Holly, um, from the national perspective, I know there are some efforts 
going on for with FGI, so the facility healthcare guidelines that kind of oversee the design and construction of um, healthcare institutions um, by putting out, um, again, guidelines. Most states ad adopt them as code, but the guidelines are there to be able to say minimums that need to happen in order for healthcare institutions to be able to operate in the way that they need to to care for patients. Um, as Michael said, though, I think there's a, a layer that goes on top of this that um, everyone just dive in and do what you need to do. And so um, certainly FGI is looking at ways to craft in the language when creating new hospitals, so not necessarily in response to right now, but the way hospitals are designed in the future, um, both renovations and new construction to provide for some of this inclusion to be able to overcome certain elements of pandemic or uh, mass casualties or um, mass disasters. So, you know, I think there's definitely an emphasis for looking at how this affects rural hospitals to major um, um, bustling city hospitals and the way it's written so that neither one of them are pinned down by a guideline to where it wouldn't necessarily work for their their smaller hospital versus the large hospital. So understand that all of that's being thought about in, in every step of the way here. Excellent, well, thank you guys. Um, I guess the next question we wanted, or next kind of prompt is, um, so one of the things that we talk about a lot in EDI is about um, kind of representation and who has seats at the table. Um, and the value of having diverse, um, diverse opinions represented in the process of, of designing. Um, and there's a really great book out by uh, Carolyn Criado Perez, who was uh, interviewed by Roman Mars on 99% Invisible. And she talks a lot about how kind of um, the, the average person that we design around, um, because of the fact that um, in design and in a lot of these decision-making processes, men are sort of overrepresented that we tend to think about this person as a man. And even one of my colleagues in the EDI committee brought up that uh, recently a lot, of, um, a lot of women are failing PPE fit tests because a lot of the PPE is designed around male bodies. So um, we just wanted to, yeah, ask if you guys are seeing um, those kinds of effects. Um, who are you seeing at the table with um, healthcare facility uh, design and, and decision-making processes? Sure, um, I'll go ahead and start this one. I think the, um, certainly in response to COVID, I've seen a fair amount of elements that are um, cross-spectrum of, um, of a PPE you know, kit that may fit someone um, of a smaller stature compared to a larger stature. But even the masks that were made, I think were made in a, a way that can fit multiple different types of bodies, shapes, sizes. Um, but I, going back to um, how decisions are made and how things are designed around, I think we're starting to see such a transformation in um, diversity of that core leadership team within healthcare facilities. Um, you know, traditionally your CNO would be a nurse. Uh, your CNO would be um, a female because they've come through the nursing um, realm, whereas the CEO or CFO would traditionally be a male. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of that cross-pollinate um, throughout the decision-making team, which I think is helpful in understanding, you know, it, it works from top down. So if the top is um, diverse, then you're starting to see a lot of that information be disseminated through each of the different departments and through their next their manager levels down to the nurses. Um, and so I really feel it's starting to become a holistic, whole person approach um, to both designing and implementing um, both in an operational mode and in a caring mode. Yeah, that, that, that's gr great points there, Brenna. I would say, um, <laughs> just jokingly on the, on the PPE effort, I don't think that many of us look good in a bunny suit when we go do a field observation in an in a operating room, so. Um, but, but in all seriousness, I think that the decision making, as Brenda mentioned, is sort of top down diversity. And we're definitely seeing a lot of that right now. There's a lot of um, successful uh, females 
in in the um, C-suite roles that are helping make those decisions, as well as all the way down to you know the the physicians. I think we we typically see a diversity within the smaller user groups. You know the the finite clinicians that are providing care. Um, so so I think I, I would really echo that top down mentality, and and it it shows in health organizations and and even the model of care. Um, for that matter. I think I can count on, um, out of all my clients, a, a certain percentage of them right now that have a diverse leadership team. And I'm happy to say that percentage is quite high as opposed to on the lower end. Mm -hmm. that, that's really, really good to hear. Um, are you guys seeing, you know, just from my own kind of personal minimal experience in the healthcare system, um, are you seeing that there's still kind of a bit of a hierarchy in terms of kind of racial and ethnic uh, decision making voice in terms of like, you know, doctors kind of often being more predominantly a white group and, you know, the kind of nurses and nurse practitioners and so forth being uh, having a little bit more diversity? Uh, yes, I, I would say in my 15 years of, of doing this, it's definitely melding. Um, and there are a lot more cultural opinions at the table, a lot more ethnic backgrounds being brought up um, across the board. Are we there yet? Probably not completely. Um, but I certainly think that our culture in general is being more open to understanding um, everyone has, you know, e your mind is what's important at the table. That's, you know, that, that's what matters mm -hmm. to me. And you're going to care for this patient, then great. Sign up, you're on my team. Um, so I feel like there's been a lot more of that kind of spirit around caregiving and hierarchy. Um, do the physicians still want their own lounge? Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, but we're starting to get some of the groups to meld together a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, my yeah, partner I, is a nurse at Denver Health, and I get a lot of information from her about that. And um, I think certainly one thing is Denver Health is a, you know, Denver is a very diverse population. They have a diverse patient population, as well as staff. Um, I would think that that's true of more of larger cities and places where you are more dense and populated. And I would imagine as you go out in different locations, that, that that hierarchy and that diversity changes somewhat. I could be completely mistaken. I know that Denver Health has a lot, you know, with the female chiefs of staff and CEO people in the C-suites and, and some of them. And it's it's very impressive from my point of view is um, that's where I have my insurance from and, and as a patient. So I'm always proud of their work, but I would imagine it's different in different regions. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it's different in, in different regions um, culturally. You know, you, you look at the rural communities and, um, you know, the diversity is definitely different um, than it is in Denver, which is a highly populated and offers opportunity for diversity. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot we can learn from other cultures too, other, other um, places in this world about healthcare and we've always said it and there's you know there's there's a lot of countries that are ahead of us in the healthcare realm there's some that are behind us and we're sort of in that middle but but really everyone that comes to the table um, in our design meetings typically has a voice regardless of any ethnicity and I think any statute even you know sometimes we would run a meeting that wouldn't um, wouldn't expose the titles of the individuals and it's just an introduction of who you are and how you can contribute and then at the end of the day you could find out that um, you know your custodial housekeeping person would have uh, the best idea at the table and the physician might have the worst idea at the table and not knowing that you know breaking down those barriers right off the bat really allows you to um, to design the best possible healthcare spaces so that's an exercise we've done before and I think that it just it proves that sometimes it's kind of a preconception of, of what's out there and you you shouldn't speak unless spoken to type of thing because the your boss is at the table or, or whatever it might be. 
I'll piggyback on that, Michael, because um, I think it's a really important piece to what we do as design professionals. And um, I have certain clients, uh, I won't say their names, um, where their C-suite literally hands the decisions over to their um, each department leader and their department leaders bring in the full range of their staff to be able to speak to the different parts. Because honestly, nurse techs, they are the ones that probably know those spaces the best because they spend the most time in there. They're doing some of the hardest work with the patients. They're in the showers with them, trying to bathe them. And that's feedback we need to know when we design hospitals. Yeah, that's really great. And, you know, I hadn't heard of that kind of um, arrangement in a, in a meeting where you specifically don't reveal people's titles. I think that's actually a really uh, exciting concept that hopefully, you know, is being applied in places beyond just healthcare settings. Because, you know, like you're saying, Brenna, it's like, um, you know, the people who use those spaces, um, who often aren't necessarily the ones who have like the kind of stamping power to say, you know, yeah, this is what's going to happen here, are really the ones who, who have the most critical needs uh, around design. So that's, that's a really exciting uh, concept. Um, we've got something in from the chat, and I actually wanted to say, too, to everybody participating, you know, um, yeah, please feel free to, to bring up your questions uh, in the chat. We're going to have uh, a Q&A in probably about 10, 15 minutes, and so we'll start to um, bring up these, uh, these chat questions. Um, so please do keep uh, sending those in. Um, let's see, do you wanna do the third question, Holly? Yes, but I had to find that unmute button. <laughs> um, an another thing kind of just ties into what we were just talking about um, as, you know, patient visits are moving to telehealth. Um, a lot of hospitals are better equipped than others. And um, this is one thing my partner was talking to me about that she's concerned about is that rural communities and other communities, they don't necessarily have that um, capability or internet and, and things like that. Um, how should we address that? Is there a way to kind of fast track some of those places to help them with that? Or are there, I guess, generally, how do we address it? And then, you know, is there ways to move forward to help those communities after this lesson we've gone through? Well, that, I think that's a tough one. And that's, um, I, I wish I knew the exact answer to that because we are moving to the virtual world before we were forced to right now um you know telehealth mobile health is all um becoming more prevalent in the rural communities um they will struggle with it at first and and i'm not sure as um, design professionals how we can quite address that yet i think that i think the community has to has to help embrace it and help help us help them um find ways ways to you know um, narrow narrow that gap of not having access to the the technologies that we're forging so quickly forward with in the healthcare um, industry. So it's I don't have a good answer for this one, but I think it's a great question and I think it's something that um will be at the top of the um healthcare designers list moving forward. Well and it maybe become we become a little more political. I know that a lot of times we try to not be political and we try to stay neutral, but this is something that has to be brought forward where we need to be getting those services to people who aren't having them. Internet. You know, rural communities should right. have internet. So I think um a few things to add to this topic. Um if we could piggyback on from what um, the education world is doing right now. So um, I know that there are some regions where not every child has been able to do online learning um, in this instance because they don't have the same thing. They don't have access to internet. They don't have access to a computer or iPad to be able to do the online platform. And I've seen community donation drives. I've seen um, 
uh, the internet service providers be able to go out and put a hub in a local community space where one at a time students are able to go in and they clean that space afterwards for another student to be able to access it. So I think there's, like Michael said, I think there's a community element to this um, as well as there are provider, not healthcare, but service providers that need to chip in and be able to support some of these locations that don't necessarily have the same capacity um, as some of the major cities do. And it's been incredible to see some of the community contributions over, over all of this. Um, hopefully this helps us create a platform where there is no community without access. Excellent. Um, so I think the next question, um, one of the things that this whole crisis, you know, brought back into my memory were some uh, things that I've uh, listened to and read about, about hand washing and about some of the challenges um, of getting, uh, getting healthcare professionals and particularly physicians to wash their hands according to appropriate protocols. Probably that's being taken quite seriously now. <laughs> Um, but there were some interesting kind of clever um, strategies to make that happen, including um, posting pictures of like petri dishes that have bacterial growth and kind of showing how quickly that can happen um, above sinks to help remind doctors to, to wash their hands after, you know, just regular, please wash your hands or, uh, you know, that kind of sign uh, wasn't working. Um, do you guys see any kinds of opportunities to sort of use aspects of healthcare design to make kind of unconscious bias and, uh, and equity um, more visible to healthcare workers? Um, so I don't necessarily know about healthcare workers, but I can talk to this in a grander scheme. I know there's been discussions going on from a city-wide perspective where there is different protocols for entering different buildings, um, including everyone. There's now a vestibule where everyone has to walk, go into that vestibule, wash their hands before you go into a building. Um, and so I think there are ways that this will trickle down into how um, healthy or how clean the community can be. Um, but certainly as it revolves around healthcare, um, I had to take my four month old into the pediatrician the other day for his, for his shots and I was nervous about going. I you know, didn't want to expose him, myself, our family to anything, but I can honestly say it was a very um, comforting in some way experience. They took my temperature before I walked in the door. They took his temperature before we walked in the door they cleaned everything they handed to me, whether it was a pen, a, um, a clipboard. Um, I watched them wipe down every table before either I put a bag down or put my child down. And so I think there's a level of reaction and certainly that's not gonna stay um, top of mind, you know, if, if and when hopefully this starts to move its way out. Um, but I think there's definitely a level of cleanliness that will start to come back into play and hopefully those types of um, what happens to be a rule right now um, becomes a habit. Yeah, I think that that's a good point, Brenna. I, right now, everyone is, is you know, personal hygiene is of, of the highest criticality as we go out in, um, into the communities when we do leave our homes. You know, I, I had to take my wife's car into the, the shop and, um, I was surprised that uh, dealerships are essential um, operations right now, but they are and thankful for us because I guess we do need a vehicle, um, even though we're supposed to stay at home. But anyways, I mean, that uh, they were cleaning everything. You know, they wiped down everything before they got in. They're going to wipe down everything when we get it back. And, and it's, it's because we're all being told that's what we need to do now and that we all have an investment to contribute. Um, at this current moment, I, I hope that holds through, you know, the, the Petri dish um, at a sink to, to get you to wash your hands. I'm not sure the effectiveness on that versus, hey, we're living the real world and this is a big problem. And if you don't do this, you know, it's going to happen, you know, um, you know, it's the saying that a, a 
toilet seat is cleaner than a toothbrush or whatever those those analogies are um they never really stick until it's real and i think now that it's real hopefully it changes moving forward and um and we all do a better job individually and and most of all the clinicians you know there's a lot of technology out there we've seen in in some healthcare sites they you know they wear this little uh, clip on their badge that um kind of tracks when they clean their hands and when they enter and exit a room and if they've done so 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 it's out there it just it just needs to become habit um but yeah i think i think now that it's real it is becoming a habit i just hope we don't lose that Holly, do you want to jump in on another question? Sure. Um, there's a relationship between economics and architecture um, that's often the driving force of a project, the budget. Um, how does that play into spaces and changes we're discussing, specifically for the populations already at risk and vulnerable? Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at with that is, you know, instead of the budget being slashed when there's a, a an opportunity to bring a human factor in um, obviously the budget drives our projects i mean it's not going to go away but how do you influence your end users when there's something really important you know um for myself whenever i'm at the pharmacy waiting i try not to sit well now i now i would but I used to try to not sit away from someone because i didn't want them to feel like i was avoiding them and that there was something bad about them. Um, so how do we continue to keep that human factor and allow people to feel okay in a space and comfortable and welcome? That, that's a good question. And it I just clicked on the Q&A. It, it relates directly to um, Deborah's question about um, kind of the, the appearance of our behaviors, wearing masks, keeping six feet away from each other. Um, you know, I think that um, what you mentioned, Holly, is uh, prior to this is, yeah, contrary of what we're telling everyone to do now, which, which we're hearing is what everyone's going to be doing for a while. You know, social distancing is not going to go away on the day that it's determined. Um, it's going to linger with us and we're all going to be thinking differently. So I think that's a great question on how do you how do you provide, you know, existing or new spaces and that comfort level that um, you're in a safe place, right? Nobody likes going to the doctor or the hospital, mainly because you get sick when you go there. If you're not already sick, you might come out of there and be sick. So, so I mean, that's our goal is, as healthcare designers is to really make the best spaces to make everybody feel comfortable, um, you know, the clients and the staff to, to really feel like it's a place they can go to, they can trust that it's clean, you know, the, the air systems are well, and the care they're getting is top notch because it looks and feels like that type of space. Right now, everyone's definitely going to be defensive as we move forward and, and make sure there's a chair or two between you and the next person in the waiting room. I think a lot of what we um, strive to do as design professionals is to um, design to a level of choice. Um, and so whether some spaces may make one patient feel comfortable that make another patient feel apprehensive and being able to have that diverse environment to be able to choose where you're sitting, choose who you talk to, um, choose how you register. Do you need to talk to someone in order to register for your appointment or have you done that already online? Like those are choices that we're um, again, striving to be able to give patients that autonomy over. And I don't know that we're there yet, and certainly this will play an impact on it, but um, as these things come up, you know, you can't assume how everyone feels in their space. And, you know, it's something that we have to do to be able to um, provide a, a variety of different options. Yeah, I think Deborah's question about masks too is interesting. It doesn't necessarily directly relate to healthcare environments, but um, you know, one of the things that got brought up in the process of starting to require masks is um, a lot of black men started feeling very uncomfortable about entering stores and, and other places wearing a mask because of 
the kind of, um, you know, nervousness that that could elicit from owners and, and workers at the store. Um, and I, myself being African-American had the exact same thoughts, uh, well before masks were even required, but I started seeing some people wearing them. Um, I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to jump right into doing that right away. Um, and so, yeah, that's just something that, you know, things that maybe, you know, some people don't get affected by or might not even think about, oh yeah, like wearing a mask, of course I'll do that. Other people might feel a little bit nervous about getting into doing something that could save their own life or somebody else's. Well, I think we should probably go ahead and um, get into some of the Q&A here. Um, I think one of the first questions that came up, which I think is a really good one, um, how do the conversations address economic diversity of patients in areas of higher poverty? And I guess that's a good question for you guys. I mean, do you feel that the, um, you know, particularly like areas of the state that are higher poverty, rural areas, um, are they having a lot more trouble um, with their facilities coping with um, COVID response? Well, uh, I would say that our, our recent experience is um, that those types of populations and areas are not equipped to deal with this, nor, you know, they never were equipped barely to deal with their current situations, never mind, um, you know, a pandemic of this magnitude. So uh, the hope in the economic aspect is that um, there is diversity and that, um, you know, economic stimulus are, are spread beyond the walls of, of just the, um, you know, the major cities that are showing numbers and have data because there's a lot of other areas in our country that, you know, we don't know what those, what, what's going on right now because we're not, you know, we're not testing, the, the news anchors aren't, aren't in there right now and the, the hospitals are just doing whatever they can. They're not doing anything extra because they don't have the support um, economically that other other major healthcare systems might be. So I think from my personal perspective, I really hope that this actually opens up some economic diversity, um, you know, and the CARES Act spreads out through um, the rural communities and actually helps and, and specifically targets those areas to focus on putting money and, and attention that, that they may have lacked previously. I also think there's um, a, a toolkit that was put together by the National AIA AH group um, in the specific task force that was in response to COVID-19. But I think the checklist could be um, certainly something that could be utilized and widespread across all different um, diversities of economic or all different economic uh, diversities for healthcare and if they are not able to check some of those boxes, then they should have priority over getting some funding to be able to make sure that they're checking those boxes and caring for their patients in the right way. Whether that's supplies, whether that's space, um, all, you know, all different org staff, you know, honestly, some, some facilities are having to lay off staff because the elective surgeries are down and some facilities are just begging for our staff members to be able to come support them. So, you know, I think it's a cross section of need um, in regards to different populations. Great. Well, thank you guys. Let's get into some more questions. Um, another one was, we hear in the news that healthcare systems and facilities, as busy as they are, are struggling financially now more than ever. Um, I guess this is kind of related um, to this uh, question that we just talked about, but um, with small rural facilities closing down and talking about typically these small communities have little access in any distance uh, from home shorter than an hour to just drive. Um, uh, are, yeah, so is this already affecting the limited access Coloradans have to healthcare services? I think it depends on if um, it's a system facility or if it's an independent facility. So if it's a facility within a system of uh, healthcare institutions, they're a little bit more supported and probably have, are still able to provide more access to healthcare than some that are independent rural 
um, facilities. They may act on a smaller amount of funding. Um, they don't have the support of the mothership, so to speak, to be able to share staff or to share resources and supplies. Yeah, I would say, you know, my personal experience, um, my folks live up in the Eagle Valley and Eagle County has been hit pretty hard. Uh, it's not extremely rural like some of the um, eastern communities out here in the Denver metro area, but but the access is still um, very remote. You know, there's only a few facilities that they can go to. You know, A, it's the doctor's office, which is now shut down. B, it's the closest hospital, which is probably 30, 40 minute drive. And then those hospital capacities, um, you know, they can't take the volume in a situation right now. So I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I, I think it's known that the rural communities struggled before and may struggle during this current time. And again, the hope is that we can try and address that and notice it. And maybe this is, you know, there's always a silver lining in everything. So right now I think rural hospitals could thrive moving forward because people understand what kind of situation they would be in if and when this does happen again. I would also be interested in seeing some of the statistics across the board um, on, you know, number of cases percentage-wise in some of the rural communities. Um, in some way, rural, rural communities right now are benefiting a little in that they're already distanced apart from one another a little bit more so than some of the more <laughs> dense urban environments. Um, so they're not, you know, by percentage, they're not necessarily being hit as hard, but by um, but then again, they don't have as much access or as many resources to be able to respond if they are um, affected by it. So I think um, it's a matter of, again, disseminating that, um, that protocol and disseminating those materials and resources to areas like that immediately in order to be able to help them defend in a case like this. Yeah, was, yeah I, I think that is true. Hopefully we'll We'll learn a lot. I assume you guys both, I'm just going to quick say something. We have another question that in your practice, after you're done with the project, that there is certain data you follow and continue to collect data and get information from your end users so that as you move forward, you're um, constantly learning about there's certain matrix that you watch. So Holly, we Ideally, in every case, we do what's called a post-occupancy evaluation. So certain metrics that the facility wanted to have as a high priority for us to design around, we kind of we track those post-occupancy as they're being used from a six month, one year, 18 month duration. Mm -hmm. um, while that doesn't always happen, that's the ideal case model. And then we are able to learn a lot as both in the six month the one year and the 18 month time frame to see how things have changed. Are staff using the space the same way that they have been in the past? Um, has something like this come into play and affected the way they work in the space and that, you know, maybe we should consider a more flexible environment for the future to give them the adaptability to change over time, which is always something that we're um, asked to kind of design around and there's certainly an element of flexibility and adaptability within every design. And it's usually um, a top priority of a lot of our clients. So with that, the next question is, um, hospitals are traditionally operated at near capacity with average patient loads. How do we start to redesign healthcare to handle potential future pandemics that overload the system? Is there an opportunity for flexible spaces that convert to meet the demand for more beds. I would say absolutely. I think this is going to change the way future facilities are designed. No question about it. Um, and the flexibility is um, the easiest target to um, be successful at implementing. I would say, you know, right now what what we're seeing, and I think what I've heard just just in the media is that hospital census is not surging like we thought it would be, which is sort of good, but I think it contributes, you have to look at what it, why it is that way, and the contributions are elective surgeries. You know, it's a big one. Those are, those are shut down. So that's, that's the big money maker for a lot of these hospitals. Um, it, it keeps their doors open, it keeps their beds full, 
Um, so now that they might have a whole wing of recovery that is vacant because they can't do elective surgeries, that could be, could have been, or could be in the future, a place, um, you know, to house um, infected patients all, all in one area. But but previously as designed, it just doesn't lend itself to that. So it, it would take some major modifications, um, and I don't think you could do it quick enough to respond to the current epidemic. But but moving forward, yeah, we're, I mean, every space we design, and I think, as Brenda mentioned, you know, those facility guidelines are probably going to be a direct response to this and say, how can we be more flexible and make these hospitals function so that we don't have to go out to old hotels or convention centers and set up cots, make, make our healthcare systems be able to, to um, create that influx of volume, because I think the volume's still there. They have the space. They just don't have the right spaces at the moment. And, and that'll all change moving forward. And just to add to that, uh, Michael, because I think those points are are valid. Um, some examples to kind of complement your your commentary there. You know, as elective surgeries go down, that was you know the first element that a lot of facilities um, were able to help with surge capacity. But I think you'll see in the guidelines as we move forward a dual head wall system so that. Every patient room could then handle two. Every private room could handle two patients because they have two head walls set up. You'll see ventilators being able to be split into multiple ventilator um, to be able to care for multiple patients at a time. I think you'll start to see um, med gases in corridors, um, in EDs to handle surge and flux capacity. And then I think you'll start to see some um, what I would call infectious uh, disease units where the entire patient, the entire unit would be a negative pressure unit as opposed to a negative pressure room. So they could easily mm -hmm. convert that to be, instead of having to convert every room at a time, they'd convert the whole unit. So you'd end up with 10, 12, 20 beds to be able to handle patients that are infected. So I think those are all, while they, see, they may seem minor at the moment, they all obviously have a cost impact to them. Yeah. And, um, but I think that cost impact could go a long way knowing what we're dealing with today. Yeah, Whoa. and I think if, if I might add one more one more thing real quick, Larry, um, you know, that's those are great examples of the physical space. And I think that this current situation right now, um, those facility guidelines are not just physical space, but they're also operational. And emergency preparedness plans um, had just become in the past couple of years um, elevated and um, facilities were getting marked for not having them or not having them you know coherent i can tell you right now that every single health system moving forward will have a very accurate emergency preparedness plan and i think that that should comfort us um, in a sense you know we can only do as much as we can do in the physical space but but really having that action plan in place is um it it, it was always a requirement but now it's going to be a requirement that that everyone um, recognizes much more I guess kind of piggybacking on that, I wanted to know, um, you know, are there other countries, speaking of kind of bringing diverse voices, are there other countries that are doing um, those kinds of things already um, in terms of incorporating like whole sections that can be negatively pressurized or, you know, something along those lines um, that we can learn from here in the States? I think there are definitely certain countries that have reacted to or were more prepared for um, something like this than, than we were, but, um, and they're able to install temporary facilities and take them down a little bit faster than I think we responded to. Um, but I do think there's, what I've seen has been a lot more um, uh, government-led and community-based uh, reactions in other countries compared to physical reactions in the way we've handled it. Not to get political, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is political. I mean, there is a political aspect to it that we, you know, we can address delicately. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to dance around it. <laughs> um, so one of the other questions that came up, um, I think is a really interesting one is, um, and I think this is asking within facilities, are there accommodations for different cultural behavior and expectations? 
Uh, do we know what is right and appropriate for other groups? And like what comes to mind to me is like, you know, are there in like dealing with, you know, patients who are um, maybe like under normal circumstances, not under kind of this COVID situation, but um, you know, whose families want to uh, have certain kinds of cultural practices around, you know, their, their being sick. Um, are there ways that you guys are seeing um, the, that being accommodated in design? I think design is starting to understand cultural diversity more than it has in the past. Um, certainly when it comes to different areas within the hospital that family members can get away from the intense environments they might be in. So I think you're seeing a lot of multi-purpose spaces that can be used for family gatherings when it's important for cultural celebrations. Um, in long-term care facilities, we're certainly planning in some of these spaces that accommodate larger family and environments to be able to allow them to still celebrate certain moments in life that are important to, to them. Um, from a specific bedside or um, level of care perspective, I'm not sure I can speak directly to that. Um, just in that, you know, I know most facilities are taking a, a higher stance on understanding a patient's perspective and the patient has a bit more of autonomy in their delivery of care than they ever have in the past. And so it's more of a family-centric, patient-centric model as opposed to a, a doctor or medical professional driven model. Yeah, and I think to add to that, we're, you know, the intention of designing spaces is so that everybody can use them equally. Um, and feel equally comfortable in them. What that means, you know, we talked about flexibility in space, and I think flexibility in use is sort of the same thing. You know, you, it could be the same four-sided room that is, is used for an exam room and also used for um, a small meeting room for, for the family. You know, so things like that, that, that you have to respect the cultural aspects of, you know, either larger families or, or different, um, even religious, you know, a lot of these healthcare systems are based on religion, but they won't, they will let you in their, their door if you don't practice their religion. So, so even though it's religious based and their model of care is based around um, a type of philosophy, I think from the designer aspect, making those spaces feel comfortable for everyone and everyone can be able to use them so they're not there's no seclusion um, intentionally designed in any of these spaces. Excellent. I really also love this uh, comment somebody posted uh, in the chat. There's no dancing around the politics anymore. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, we've got one more question in the Q&A and then I guess maybe uh, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up um after that um how are we as design professionals able to support the overall health and well-being of the population given common constraints of limited budgets and fast schedules our best practice design is going to adapt to meet the new needs of our society so that's a pretty pretty broad one but important um you were on mute, Brenna. Did you want to start? I can. Um, it certainly is a, a large question, so I'll try to break it down into a little bit uh, smaller sections here. But um, I do know that the folks that put together some of these best practices or what I'm referring to when I talk to FGI is a very extreme cross-section of who's working in the healthcare arena. Um, so it's, it's not just architects. It's not just folks um, from a code review, it's, it ha the FGI review board has nurses, doctors, um, uh, facility managers, architects, engineers, to be able to really understand what we mean by best practice and how to be able to implement that into the, the hospital, um, whether or not we're going to be able to make that economically sustainable for every um, part of society. I, I can't really explain and I'm not sure that I'm actually even addressing your question. Um, but 
just know that there is a sensitivity to try to understand adaption, how facilities can adapt and meet the needs of different areas within the country. Yeah, it, it's a it's a good question because I think it it's looking at the bigger picture, um, and so so the the comment about the constraints on budget and schedules, I don't know that that'll ever change. I mean, you rarely do you have a project that that has a relaxed budget and schedule. So I think I hope now with with some political and government funding that the budgets will be. Um, We'll be focused a little bit more on on providing the best decisions versus the best bottom line, uh, um, and, and I think that, that that directly relates into how the best practices become moving forward. They're they're going to adjust. They always change. Best practices are really only the best practice until until something better and newer comes along. Which this is this is affording us the opportunity to make things better. Um, as we move forward. So there's going to definitely be some adaptation in in the society and how we provide for care and how us as design professionals can help support that. So I think we are really here to advocate and support that, um, you know, the community's interest is at best hand and that we can help support the initiatives of those healthcare providers to give them the best tools um, in a physical environment um, that we possibly can and we're we're going to learn a lot i don't think it's going to be you know in the next two weeks we're not going to learn a whole lot but in the, in the next several years um things will change and you know there will be a new virus that we have to deal with but hopefully this will help us provide some best practices like the economics of putting two head walls in a patient room you know that's that's double the money for that specific um piece of equipment or, or, or area. Health systems will have to say, okay, we're going to pay the extra money because it's the right thing to do, whether they can afford it or not. They know that it's the right thing to do because in the future it is going to prove that that decision was in the best interest of the community. Yeah, I think there's a level of sustainability and resiliency that kind of weaves through um, a fair amount of this discussion today and so whether that's um, uh, health and well-being from a nutrition perspective that goes into in general our overall health so that we're not in hospitals as much you know I think there's a bigger societal impact that this may have to um, be able to really focus on your mind body and and spirit and um, how you take care of your own personal self and then how you affect others in the community um, so I think there's there's just a, a million levels of gradation of how all of this will trickle down, and I think you know some of it starts from ground up and some of it starts from top down. Well, I think that's a really great comment to kind of wrap up on. I mean, I think um, you know we in kind of EDI work um, really think that an equitable society and a just society is a society that people are healthier in and. Um, you know, kind of can help address some of these um, health disparities that lead us to having, um, you know, inequitable distribution of something like COVID. So um, thank you guys for your time today. This has, I think, been really enlightening. Um, I don't work at all. I have never worked in the, the sort of healthcare design side of things. So this has been really cool to learn a bit from, from you guys about some of the nitty gritty of, of how that works. Yeah, let's yes, uh, virtual applause for our panelists and our moderators today. Um, thank you all for leading the discussion. I think it was really meaningful. And thanks to everyone who joined online and uh, for your questions and for participating. And I'm hopeful we'll do something like this again and stay, uh, look at our calendar, make sure you're up to date on all the events that are coming up because we're going to have a lot of community conversations and there's a lot to talk about. So thank you all for doing this today. <laughs>